actually glad and a tiny bit surprised to see that so many of you have decided to stay here. Thank you very much. I'm sure this will be a worthwhile discussion. And the reason I say that is because on stage with me, I have four individuals, all of them with PhDs. And not only that, but they're also distinguished academics in the field of uh, cybersecurity. And uh, indeed, what we're here to do today is to discuss this book, Stri Cyber Strategy, The Evolving Character of Power and Coercion. And to my right, I have Brandon Valeriano. He's the lead author of this book. Brandon is the Donald Brunt Chair of Armed Conflict at the Marine Corps University in the United States. He's also a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council with the Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Now, Brandon has a significant uh, publication record in, on cyber matters, and cyber strategy is actually his fifth book, which was just published by Cambridge, I'm sorry, Oxford University Press. I'm used to saying Cambridge University Press because of Charlie Manual. <laughs> then next to Brandon, uh, we have um, Tim Stevens. Tim Stevens is lecturer in global security at the famous Department of War Studies at King's College London. And at that college, he also heads their cyber security research group. Uh, Tim also has uh, published widely on cyber matters. His recent book, now published by Cambridge University Press, is called Cybersecurity and the Politics of Time. Then third, we have Aaron Brantley. Aaron is assistant professor at the Hume Center for National Security and T Technology at Virginia Tech, also in the United States. And he is also a cyber policy fellow at the Army Cyber Institute at the United States Military Academy in West Point. And then fourth, we have Christopher White. Christopher is assistant professor in the program on Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness at the Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, he teaches cybersecurity policy, conflict and law, international security, political risk analysis, and strategic planning. So this really is a distinguished panel that we have here today. So Brandon, to start with, congratulations on this book. Thank That's you. a big achievement. You wrote this together with uh, Benjamin Johnson and Ryan Maness. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this book? What is it about? What was the message that you tried to convey with it? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I have a few slides just to make it a bit easier and to show the cover of the book. Uh, I believe we were out of books already. I'm really sorry about that. I tried to get a batch mailed to Estonia, but um, for some reason that was gonna cost $800. So um, I shoved as many as I could in my, my, book my, uh, my suitcase, and uh, I believe we have one left and that is it. So I don't know how we're gonna give that last one away, but I'll, I'll give it away to someone. So that's the cover. The book is called Cyber Strategy, The Evolving Character of Power and Coercion. Basically the book is a focus on coercion and it's an offshoot of my prior book, Cyber War Versus Cyber Realities with Ryan Manis. And in that book, we sought to scope the cybersecurity domain and answer some empirical questions about what's happened in the last 10 years at that point. But after that, we really realized there's a lack of strategic analysis in the field. And that was brought home very clearly to me as I teach at the Marine Corps University now. And everything the military does is about planning and knowing the adversary. And I felt in the field of cybersecurity, we kind of haven't really done that so much, especially from an empirical quantitative perspective. So that was the goal of this book, to kind of avoid the megafauna approach. And the megafauna approach is this sort of focus on the big game and to focus on like say the pandas or the, the, the elephants, the, the grander aspects of biology. And I think the goal really is to focus on the complete picture of cybersecurity and more importantly to look at the efficacy of cyber actions. Or as Tim Stevens just said earlier today, um, we need to understand the ways and means to achieve effects. And that's basically the goal of this entire book. It's both an empirical and a qualitative effort to delineate for the last 15 years what has happened in the cybersecurity field, have cyber tactics been effective, and what has been their, um, their impact. And we argue really that there haven't been very much knockout effects but there remains to be a path to chaos and destruction in this domain. And that really flows from this sort of idea that what we see now is a modern form of political warfare. I don't like using the term hybrid warfare, but really what we're seeing is an extension of espionage and covert attempts to signal to the adversary. And paradoxically, 
by advertising a signal of risk and higher costs for action, we actually see cyber be a form of escalation management. And by delineating cyber attacks into disruption, espionage, and degrade operations, we get a better picture of the field, and we can sort of delineate a, uh, a process by which most operations occur. And when you break it down by that, you kind of see something different. You kind of find that basically most cyber coercion events produce limited concessions. We coded 192 operations, and only five of them, about 5% of them, have been termed as a success. Uh, we find that cyber degradations are more likely to achieve success or to achieve coercive compellence. The problem with that finding, though, is it's mostly limited to the United States. So if you have one state driving your findings, you don't really have that much confidence in those results from a social science perspective. Uh, we find statistically that neither past incidents, uh, neither latent cyber power or p the number of past incidents has any effect on coercion in cyberspace. Really, the thing that has the most effect is military and economic power. We don't see much of an escalation ladder. We don't see much of escalation at all. Most cyber exchanges, if they do escalate, they escalate in the context of ongoing disputes that already have been uh, escalating from s some time. Most cyber events are proportional and really achieve a limited threshold of tit-for-tat responses. And then we also break this out by case studies by looking at Russia, China, and the United States, which we can talk about more in the Q&A possibly. But th to wrap it up, really, we find that digital effects have been slow to emerge. And I think that's really a key finding from the perspective of knowing just what cyber effects are good for. You know, recently Ash Carter wrote a long uh, article for the Balfour Center about how cyber effects weren't very useful against ISIS. And I think we really haven't done an interrogation of just what is the utility of cyber effects. And I think really we need more empirical research to back up these dramatic claims of a revolution in military affairs. Instead, I think what we see more is this process of what George Keenan called back in the 1940s of modern political warfare. Combat below the threshold of armed hostilities. It's something different, but we don't have good theories to explain covert action. We don't have great theories to explain espionage as it occurs in cyberspace. And I think really in the future, unpacking what disruption and cyber harassment means and how it occurs by rogues or revisionist actors will probably be an important question that we need to tackle. So that was the goal of the book, that was the intention of the book, that's what we tried to achieve. So Brandon, as you uh, translated your empirical anal analysis to a strategic analysis, uh, what would you say which uh, states are currently winning <laughs> in employing cyber capabilities to their strategic advantage? If there's any winner, it's the United States, but the problem is I don't think there really is any such thing as winning in cyberspace, because the problem is once you use your cyber tools, once you use your, uh, your, your methods, they can be used right back against you. So one of the challenges is, and this came out in a Senate hearing recently, they were trying to explain to a senator about the analogy of throwing rocks in a glass house. And I think the United States is the most vulnerable so even though they're probably the most effective cyber power, they're also the most vulnerable cyber power. So this domain comes with great costs. Even if you think you may achieve victory, that weapon, quote unquote, can be used right back against you. And that's a challenge of the long term. Let me turn to your friends on this panel. Chris, let me ask you, so what do you think uh, is the most salient point that Brandon, Benjamin, and uh, Ryan make in the book? So I think, the, I think the most critical feature of the findings of this book is not necessarily any one specific uh, finding that comes out of their empirical analysis so much as what they've done in aiming at core assumptions in the cyber conflict field. Um, a lot of what tends to happen with uh, research on cyber incidents um, is, uh, you know, people take a macro historical uh, case study approach or, uh, or a, a several small case study approach to trying to understand the incidence of a cyber course of campaign in depth, you know, one or two times. What they've done here in doing a large end empirical study 
um, that actually focuses on a broad range over a 14-year period um, is they've essentially enabled themselves to uh, talk about core hypotheses and core assumptions in the research program rather than just peripheral hypotheses. And this is important because um, cyber conflict studies, this is a, a very young field. Um, we don't actually have the theoretical, the conceptual core um, precepts to turn to. Um, to comment on when we do this, this kind of small-scale case-by-case analysis that, you know, terrorism studies might or studies of extremism or something along those lines. Um, I would say that um, what they've done here um, in kind of, uh, there, there are two main uh, conclusions that come out of the, I know we talk about cyber power, I think we can get that one maybe separately in our discussion. The two main conclusions that come out of um, their empirical analysis that um, degradation style operations alone create concessionary behavior amongst uh, uh, target states. Um, and also that escalatory behavior in cyberspace appears to be tit for tat. It appears to be uh, limited in terms of the escalatory value of the thing. Um, this uh, kinds, kind of gives us um, the the, the empirical basis or the theoretical basis now to uh, move to on to questions of cyber coercion as something more nuanced than just states undertaking large-scale clear campaigns to communicate a threat and hopefully gain a clear policy concession. Um, are we uh, actually talking about um, a lot of um, disruptive or espionage style operations as being some sort of uh, inter-institutional signaling, right? The um, uh, Russians are signaling um, the NSA uh, to not continue with a particular mode of approach or something along those lines. I think that's what this book does extremely well. Wonderful. Tim, do you agree? What was your main takeaway from the book? And to add to that, why should people who are responsible for cyber strategy development uh, read this book? Okay. <clears throat> I agree with Chris. I, I think the central uh, finding that um, cyber operations can actually increase stability is an important counter to the general assumption that it increases instability. So um, I think that's an interesting finding um, that we can continue to test empirically as well. Um, and that's the important thing about this book is that it, it overturns or challenges some of the inbuilt assumptions about the way we view this environment and provides a basis for future, future testing. I also like the framing of this issue as an issue of political warfare um, rather than one necessarily of war or, or of various other terms that, um, that we encounter in this field. It's got a very kind of Kenan-esque feel to it that I think has a lot of validity in the current strategic environment. Um, I also like the, uh, and I've been arguing this for years, which is perhaps why I, why I like it, but. Um, Brandon makes the point with his co-authors that we need to pay attention to the physicality of the so-called virtual. Um, and we've heard that in the previous panel as well. There has been a temptation to think of this, this domain, if it is that, in something of an abstract, virtualized form, but in actual fact, all the actors, right down to the machines involved, are physical artifacts, they're physical actors, they ha are located in time and in space. And unless we realize that in the way we think uh, about this environment, it's going to be impossible to formulate strategy uh, or understand this environment. And I think that's one of the things, it wasn't one of your main kind of thematics in the book, but it's something that, that you address, and I think more of us need to address that. So I, I, I think that's a very useful uh, takeaway. Why read it? Um, well, I think your policy makers and strategic planners um, get a handle on evidence-based theories and models of strategic interactions in this environment, and they're much better placed to formulate policy and strategy uh, rather than um, kind of uh, use received wisdom to do so. And I'm not, I don't mean to insult anybody who's working in that space, but we all know that an awful lot of political and politicized statements are made about cyber that don't necessarily have a, a, a any sort of evidence-based foundation. So this book goes a long way towards providing that kind of evidence-based uh, framework for thinking through strategy. Aaron, I'm going to ask you the same question, <laughs> but I'm also going to ask you, is there something that Brandon and his co-authors could have done better? Is there something <laughs> that you disagree with that you <laughs> did not like? So first let me say, I think that in 
Over the years, the study of cybersecurity as a field in international relations has kind of spanned from Thomas Ridd on the very conservative right to maybe Clark on the far side of, you know, Cyber Pearl Harbor is about to happen and the world's going to end. And so I think that this book sort of falls uh, center Ridd, uh, if, if you will. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this concept of, of measured approaches to uh, intellectually engaging with the problems. Uh, oftentimes we engage on a case-by-case -case basis, and so when you're very close to a case like Stuxnet or NotPetya or something like that, it, it really kind of seems like, you know, the world is, is you know, coming to an end and, and the reality is, and we fail to oftentimes put that into a contextual framework of a larger data set. And I think that in many ways that is what the, this book and the book that preceded it have really done, and it really advanced the field in a measurable way in, in terms of, of getting that argument out there. Um, the challenge, though, is, is that we know that, the, that this is a sample of a data set because obviously there's many more acts going on than the ones being undertaken. And the fundamental challenge within that sample is that uh, there are, uh, there's an enormous amount of, of activity going on in this field. And so the question that, that, that if you were to, to really hit back kind of hard at this book is if, if the field if, if cyber is not a very uh, successful coercive instrument of power, then why do states seemingly, particularly weak states in an asymmetric sense, seemingly try to employ it so frequently? And maybe this is uh, something that, that we can discuss a little bit more, but it, it does seem like uh, there are a large number of incidents that occur, and so states perhaps are achieving a utility and that we may not be understanding how they perceive success in that domain. And that might be something that we can delve into a little bit more. Brandon, how would you respond to that? Well, I agree, I agree completely. I mean, one thing is that data is always a work in progress. No data set is the end all be all. We are always updating, we're always adding more. And uh, Chris and I, we have a panel um, tomorrow on the machine learning method of collecting better data and more data. So we'll get there at some point. I always liked my friend's point um, about this. So he kind of says I'm a year behind. And I'll take that because at least we're somewhere. At least we're getting to some basic set of core knowledge. And the other thing about weak states is um, that's exactly the topic of our next book that we're trying to pitch now on cyber rogue actors and revisionist states because I think that they see this as a way to catch up against big states or, or strong states or great powers. And I don't think it really works, but it, it is a method of signaling that they choose to use. And the question is really why? And uh, another thing we're going to start to do more is to do more experiments to look at the decision-making process. And that's why I've always liked your work, Aaron, because you've dived into the sort of decision-making, the expected utility method of understanding this, this space. And I don't think a lot of other people have done that so far. So um, in some ways, when I talk about cybersecurity intellectually or academically, I speak of it as academic tundra and that there are a lot of questions that need to be asked and there's, there's not so many oases of knowledge that we have yet, but we're building there, we're getting there, and hopefully we'll get to a better place in the next 10 years. Can I just uh, hop in and actually add to something that Aaron said? Yeah, um, I think part of the reason that this kind of book is good at this time is um, because we seem to be in one of those periods, we've had a few of them over the last 30 or so years, where there is greater incidence of cyber events that seem to be making a, a broad scoped political, economic, societal splash, right? And it's the, I mean, you can think back to the late 90s with um, Solar Sunrise, the leak of the um, FBI informing con Congress about Moonlight Maze, a series of things all at once that tend to lead in the public domain to, you know, cyber doom networks coming. Um, but on the scholarly side, produces um, case study analyses um, that are, you know, it's like a lamplighter approach. The things that we've suddenly shone our light on, they become the sole focus of our analytic conversation. And that can lead to, at the worst, threat inflation, um, but at the best, um, a somewhat less than rigorous analytic approach to understanding these issues. And so that's why I think, particularly at this juncture again, because I think it seems like with, you know, WannaCry, NotPetya, Russian interference across Europe and in North America, we're in another one of those periods of time. 
That is true, even in the field of international law, we tend to focus, when we talk about how the law applies, we tend to focus on those famous uh, cases uh, at which the light is always shining. But in your book, you have three different chapters, one in Russia, one in China, and one in the United States, where you go through very many more cases than the usual suspects that are always mentioned. So when you look at the strategies of those three countries in cyberspace, Obviously, they differ substantially, um, but what would you say were the perhaps not that well-known conclusions that uh, you came to as you were looking at how those three countries operate in this domain? Um, is there um, something new for, for the wider community to learn about uh, those three countries? I think particularly Russia is interesting from the perspective that people think of them as a great power in cyberspace, and I see them more as a revisionist actor as some sort of like actor just trying to cry out in the night for attention when they have very little method of making an impact otherwise. I think they've been effective at that and I think we give them too much credit for what they've been doing. So I think that's something interesting. China, we trace a path in their evolution as a state trying to acquire technology through espionage. And I think that that's a strategy that failed and I think they know that and I think they're changing strategies now. And I think that's something we need to be aware of, that you can't really steal your way to innovation. Every major state has tried that, and it's not a very effective method. And we need to think more about the evolution of Chinese strategy, because when you read writings about China, it's this sort of static view of things that happened in the 80s that aren't exactly happening anymore. Now, the United States, particularly, they follow this method of uh, precision strike complexes. They focus on very precise precise strikes like cruise missiles like the Gulf War, and that's their lesson. And I think that can be effective, particularly with Stuxnet, but then we also have an overinflated view of the effectiveness of Stuxnet. And as we've seen in America, we've kind of missed the smaller picture. We've missed the harassment. We missed the information warfare that's been going on constantly. And that's a big challenge because we're focused on the grand things and we're not protecting our basic security enterprises at this point. Very interesting, because it's uh, the end of the day. Uh, it would be great uh, to also engage those of you in the audience. Do you have any questions already? Anybody want to ask? Please, Mike Schmidt. First, congratulations, so well done. I have two uh, questions, one from a work college perspective and one from a legal perspective. Since I haven't read the book, how do you define strategy? In other words, are we talking about, if we talk about political warfare, you're talking about strategic level, operational level. It sounds like you're talking at the oper operational level, but has a fellow War College faculty mm -hmm. member. I wonder if you could talk about the scope of the book in terms of the, the concept strategy. And then I was very interested in your, uh, the use of the term coercion, because as Lee's knows, we're really struggling with the concept of coercion in law because it's a legal concept. So I'm wondering, how did you define coercion for the purpose of picking your case studies or, mm -hmm. or, or for uh, crafting your data? And would you distinguish a coercive act from an act that is, for example, simply malicious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a big challenge. And one of the ways we solved that is actually, I put a bunch of lieutenant colonels in the room, bought them pizza, showed them the entirety of our data and said, what do you think the objectives were and were they successful? And that's basically how we had to basically try and code the data. Because it's difficult to make subject, uh, objective judgments about subjective data. So we had to do the best we can with that sort of limited um, knowledge. But uh, I think that's one of the utilities of working in that environment. Now in terms of defining strategy, for me I defined it more in terms of coercion, particularly looking at compellence. I think too much in cybersecurity we focus on deterrence. And the challenge for deterrence for me is really that's an unobservable. You can't know what doesn't happen with any sort of certainty. But you can kind of try and evaluate when there is an effect on the target. And that's really what we were looking for. We were looking for foreign policy events that have an effect on the target. So there's things we don't know in this space, but really we're looking for the things, the trees that do fall in public view here. And there we, we can measure an effect. Now we try and do the best we can. Some may not be satisfied with their efforts, but that's why we have replication. That's why we have other scholars come and hopefully maybe we'll challenge our views. Now in terms of strategy, that's the interesting thing about what the benefit of co-authors is. 
And I really have to give credit to Ben Jensen, who's really the military doctrine strategic an al al analyst guy. And uh, he really brought that perspective into the book, which is not really something I've dived into too much because I'm more of a quantitative international relations scholar. But really we're looking at the grand view of some sort of plan, some sort of operation, some sort of goal to make a, an effect on the target. So that's really what we thought of as strategy, but we spent a, a lot of time on that and defining that in the book. But in reality, the, the title of the book was supposed to be Cyber Coercion, um, but I will be honest, um, there is a bit of debate in the field if espionage can ever be coercion. So from that perspective, we changed the title to Cyber Strategy, which I'm quite happy with, but really I was thinking of this as, is it effective from the coercion standpoint, from the compellence standpoint? Tim and Aaron, uh, Brandon makes us uh, at least question the utility of cyber when it comes to war fighting. Uh, so Tim, you come from the famous uh, Department of War Studies at, at King's College. What do you think of that? And Aaron, likewise, you're affiliated with the United States Military Academy. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's not a big question at all, is it? Um, <laughs> Just before we came on, you said you were going to ask me about the nature and character of war and whether cyber changes it. Well, I'll tell you, I disagree with a panelist on the previous panel who said that cyber changes the nature of war. It doesn't. At present, cyber, whatever that is, use of information, computer networks, does not change the social interaction that is war or warfare, in my view. Okay? Um, now, maybe, that's, maybe I'm coming from kind of a left-rid perspective here and come from obviously war studies, which is, is, is notoriously Clausewitzian in the way that it perceives war and strategy. But war is a political act. With or without cyber, it's still a political act. Um, uh, the character of war has changed, but what we're calling cyber now is just a continuation of various informational means of war fighting or modes of war fighting, which have been going on for a very, very long time. It has happened to be more, more, intensifies, they're, they're more intensified. There are differences, of course, in the character. It evolves through time. It always has. But I don't think the nature of warfare has changed. Now, th things may change the nature of war in this informational space. Um, people talk about AI. AI is already here in some definitions of it, but in a very narrow sense. That may well, that will continue to change the character of war and war fighting. Uh, it's only if we ever get to kind of artificial general intelligence that I think we're removing we're adding another kind of intelligence ent intelligent entity to that mix, in which case the nature of war may change. There may be different conceptualizations of what are the ends of war, for example. But at the moment, I, I don't see that cyber changes the nature of war, but it certainly changes the character of it. Aaron, what do you think? So, I like the concept of political warfare because uh, the command historian at U.S. Cyber Command, Michael Warner, was on my dissertation committee and he is my mentor. And he defines intelligence as a secret state activity both to learn about a foreign state but also to influence or alter that state as a process. And I think when you look at the history of covert action, and you look at the history of how covert action has evolved uh, from uh, essentially, so, so my Twitter handle is after Westville, so from Westphalian times uh, till now, the, the utilization of covert means is very applicable to cyberspace because you are very often, particularly in a lot of the coercive activities, you're not going out there and saying, I'm going to hack this computer to make you believe this. It's more along the lines of, I'm going to change your perception of your relationship to me or your perception of your own strengths in relation to something else. You know, so I'm going to make you think that you have faster connective speeds than you really do or slower connective speeds, or I'm gonna make you think that you have some capability that you do or do not have. And I think that um, as a form of political warfare, that is, quite frankly, what covert action does. It's, it's, it works in that space beyond just collecting and providing foreknowledge. It's about altering the relationship between two different parties and how they perceive one another in a decision-making framework. 
uh, altering that conceptualization of the bargaining range. And I think that cyberspace can't, and I think that, that Brandon and, and the co-authors illustrate that while it might not be, you know, I'm gonna hack you and you're gonna surrender, uh, uh, it's more along the lines of, we're going to engage in activities that helps us to establish and learn more about one another, to, to coerce one another and to, it, and it's not a grand coercive aspect, and I think he states this, it's more of a low level kind of, these are politics by other means, but not violent war type politics. These are more of the kind of Machiavellian politics that, that go on a, lot of, on a lot of other levels. We have a couple of questions in the audience. Uh, yes, please. Hi, I'm Rod Beckstrom, uh, former CEO of ICANN and director of the U.S. National Cybersecurity Center. Uh, Brandon, it sounds like an absolutely fascinating book and work. But I want to throw out a, a case study that, that, that hit me in real life that, that may have been in, 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 your, in your story, and that is that we all remember the, the uh, you know, uh, various Chinese uh, attacks on OPM, et cetera. And then one of the responses later to that and other attacks was the, F, the criminal charges against generals in China. And when I'd meet with my FBI friends in D.C., they were very excited about, you know, how great it was finally, you know, criminal charges could be pushed and done by name and people could be shamed. And this was viewed as a great success in D.C. in general. Uh, nine months or so later, I was in China at the World Internet Conference, uh, Wuzhen World Internet uh, Conference. And the topic happened to come up of the naming and shaming of generals. And I was shocked by the Chinese response, which was, this is so disgusting and outrageous, what the Americans have done. We have to do more cyber attacks. This is so insulting, it's so unbelievable that they would shame our leaders like this. We could shame them, We'd never, we won't do it. It's not our culture. Um, and we should not only do more cyber attacks, we should possibly go kinetic because this is just so unbelievably disgusting. Uh, and I was shocked to hear this and, and got it from a few people. So. Uh, I, I like the pizza with the, the colonel's idea, you know, of getting the American perspective on the data. But let's just, let's take, take me through this one instance and, and your thoughts and analysis of was that naming and shaming effective uh, as a deterrent or was it in fact possibly counterproductive? Just would love to get your, your and the panel's thoughts and views. Well, I think there are a few things there. One, we act in cybersecurity like everything that happens is new and novel, yet there's been you know, 30, 40 years of research in human rights about naming and shaming. And they've come to a very conflicted view as to the utility of it. And I think what they say, um, you know, if I can paraphrase some of the research, is that it's very much contingent on other factors and resolve and other things that might back that up. And I think we don't really look at the entirety of the context of cybersecurity actions. And when you look at it from that perspective, as we illustrate in the Chinese case study, I think what happens there very often is it's a cycle. It's they attack, we counter, they reset and stop, and then they start again. And that's natural, and that's to be expected. That's what nations do. That's what they do in terms of espionage, and we shouldn't be shocked by that. I think what's shocking more is the academic and policy community don't really have a great language to speak about covert operations at this point. And we always try and apply it in the, the domain of war, in the domain of deterrence, and not so much in the domain of operations under the level of warfare, which take a different level of analysis to really understand how these things happen. So I think that's really critical what you're bringing back here is their interpretations, their views. And I, I was talking to Jason Healy, uh, I don't know, is he in the back somewhere? Um, hopefully he's enjoying his time, but, um, <laughs> oh, I see Jay all the time, but you know, what I was telling him is, you know, there's this new mode of research in, in international relations in Europe about the practice of international relations about how decisions are done, how things happen, and how they're interpreted. And I think we need to do more of that, and we're not. When we write these op-eds, when we write these articles, we do it from our perspective, and we make large judgments without thinking about the other side and the, the adversary. And I think that's something we need to challenge ourselves to do better at. But I am clearly American. I work for an American you know, military organization, so I have a certain bias and a perspective. Um, but I think that's for others to go forward and try to do their best to avoid that bias and try and Think about cybersecurity in a new way because things are happening a bit differently than we try and kind of map them on. I think there's another fundamental problem as well that I think that Brandon's kind of getting towards is that in the West, we've, we're very beholden to single player interactive games. Uh, we, we play the game in front of us. We play the, the, 
because our languages are structured in such a way that we focus on things as action-reaction pairs uh, in, in very structured ling language pair patterns and other types of things. But a lot of other countries don't do that. I mean, I, I speak Russian and Ukrainian, and there's, you can say the bear ate the hunter or the hunter killed the bear in like 15 different ways. And so in, the, in Chinese, the fluidity of language over time and action is very different than in action, reaction pairs in English. So when we think about coercing people and we think about strategies, in the U.S. context, we very oftentimes think of we are naming and shaming, they respond in this way. Us, them, boom, that's it. Well, the Chinese have 2,000 <coughs> plus years of history, which they consider intimate to their experience. We have 220. And so the, 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 ch the challenge is that they think of, you know, the, the, the approach to thinking about how to interact, to coerce another state is fundamentally different. There are more interactive mechanisms, if you will, you know, the consistent analogy that keeps coming up, in fact, Kissinger just wrote an article in The Atlantic about this, about using Go and, 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 and other types of things. Uh, but, you know, th their strategy is, is in getting you to see and understand. So one of the strategies in Go is not necessarily to win the game, but to understand how your opponent thinks, to open up new concepts of strat strategic thinking to your opponent. And I think that perhaps what Brandon's book is illustrating is, is that in the Western context, we're looking for, we do this, we coerce them to do that. But the other strategies are, we engaged in this activity, this helped us to learn and coerce over time in multiple different realms and leverage different levers of power consistently across multiple different venues. So of course, time matters. Yeah. Uh, Tim <laughs> Stevens wrote a great book on that at Cambridge University Press. Um, but that also leads to another research project we have. We're looking at crafts cross-national decision-making. So we're doing experiments and scenarios on many different countries to look at variations. I think that's something we need to do. We need to look at how not just Americans think or not just how university students think. We want to look at everyone's perspective and uh, we may be in your country soon doing a scenario. Um, and if you want us to come, let me know and send me your card. We'd be happy to come. But I think there's a lot of research to be done on exactly what Aaron's speaking about. Brenda, let me push you a little bit on uh, what you just said. You said that we should start thinking about cyber in a different way. So we have a lot of uh, practitioners in the room here. So what is it that you and also others in the panel was like, what is it that uh, those people should write down? So what does it mean, think about cyber differently? What is the, re the more hands-on takeaway from your research? What is it that as they go home, as they develop their cyber strategy, what should they change if they have to think about it differently? I think one of the challenges, and the US government has been pushing this idea of the life cycle of a cyber attack. And for me, that's a challenge, that's a problem because I don't see individual cyber attacks as having a particular life cycle. There's a life cycle in the negotiations in the peer-to-peer -peer or the multilateral context of all these events. I think that's what's more important. When did these things happen? What else is going on? And what do you think the, the, the goal was? Was it a signal? Were they trying to deter something? Were they trying to compel someone? I think that's the, the more important question. And I don't think we're really getting at that. And we need to have more collaboration and communication between practitioners who know a lot about what's going on in terms of individual events and the more strategic thinkers who have the, the, the wider picture and can provide that context. You know, that leads me to like a, a story from grad school where I had an economics um, a grad student friend who was showing us economic data and he was confused why in 1939 the data dipped. And you know, that's just the challenge here is that we all need to work together. There's interdisciplinarity that's really needed in cybersecurity, but we tend to do this research in silos. I think that's a problem. We need to think more about broader perspectives and that would help everyone come to greater solutions about the challenge of cybersecurity. Other recommendations? Tim, please. Sure, okay. Uh, yep, yeah, think analog about the digital. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I, I've heard it again today, think digital. We've all got to think digitally. Well, think about the digital, that's fine. Um, but somehow thinking ourselves into the world of machines or digitality or this kind of binary notion, it's exactly the sort of thing that Aaron's just mentioned, actually, about <laughs> success, failure, win, lose. 
I mean, I know it's, we, that's our only option with data sometimes, but actually what comes out of the ones and zeros of, uh, of your statistical analysis is actually this kind of graduated, um, nuanced approach that perhaps the Chinese do do better um, based for, uh, you know, than perhaps we do. But it's an analog way of thinking. It's not a digital way of thinking. It's very analog. It's very subtle. And this could apply in obvious ways, and it's beginning to surface when we, even when we think about deterrence. Um, you know, deterrence, you're right. It's, we, we, we measure it in terms of failure. If nothing happens, it's successful. If something does happen, it's failed, and we all get very distraught and cry. And, you know, obviously in nuclear terms, that's, <laughs> you've got something to cry about. But, um, you know, uh, in cyber, it's a, bit, a little bit different from that. But there are approaches emerging in deterrence when, whether people are calling it cumulative deterrence or graduated deterrence. These things are quite familiar, actually, from the conventional um, uh, weapons experience, as it were, um, that, you know, these things take time to unfold. You know, they're not just on or off in a binary sense. And having this longer-term analog way of looking at uh, war and war fighting and strategy and grand strategy and international politics and strategic interactions is perhaps my bumper sticker. So think, think analog about the digital. Hey, Chris. One of the big things that uh, I think the narrative of the book gets right is that complex circumstances matter when it comes to the outcome of course of campaigns, um, any attempt to uh, achieve some sort of concessionary result. Um, I think in it's very rare that cyber conflict should be thought of as a discrete form of conflict, right? We have this conversation anytime we try to problematize or draw a line around what like cyber intelligence looks like, that kind of thing as well. Well, it includes all of, all of the above. It includes um, MassSent and OSINT and et cetera, et cetera. The same thing is true of cyber conflict for the most part. Um, cyber conflict outcomes are only best understood or only really understood in the context of, uh, going back to, to your question actually, um, institutional and cultural circumstances around uh, the development of doctrine, um, that kind of thing. Um, so in your case actually with uh, the previous question, um, when you were talking about that knee-jerk reaction to name and shame in return, I was actually thinking of China's um, kind of unique experiences uh, with standing up their own uh, digital capabilities within the government. Um, there's a, a couple of kind of different angles you can take to go into how they, um, they kind of set everything up in the 80s and into the 90s, but I, I, do, I also do um, non-state actors in cyber conflict, um, and I couldn't help but think of the Chinese government's response to Falun Gong in the late 1990s and the sudden massive turn towards censorship and towards um, kind of uh, cyber repression through naming and shaming alongside other kinetic actions that enabled them to drive uh, an entire group underground to actually force them uh, to concede the, the, the kind of social battleground for China, essentially. Um, and so anyway, just, just briefly again, um, complex circumstances. I think that's the real kind of winning narrative that comes out later on in the book. I think it's chapter four or five, you really turn to the idea that um, concessions really only um, occur <coughs> off the back of uh, multi-moded cross-domain um, operations in cyberspace. And so again, just thinking about cyber conflict as a discrete form of conflict is never, I think, going to be a good way to go about this. We'll take another question from the audience. Yes, please, sir. Um, Philip Krüger, um, I run the German National Cyber Security Hub and um, the Agile Cyber Deterrence Project at the Fraunhofer Society. Just a short question um, from a German perspective. In Germany, um, several stakeholders are struggling currently with um, formulating new doctrinal approaches um, when it comes to cyber uh, operations, but also cyber deterrence. And um, I, I wonder the takeaway from your book, from your research, from your panel, um, where should kind of a cyber middle power like Germany, which is more conflict averse, um, uh, where should it allocate its resources right now to move forward in the space? Um, we've done a couple of things, a new cyber command and other stuff, but there's no overarching strategic approach yet. And we look a lot to the US for guidance, but uh, to come back to your uh, linguistics uh, metaphor, German is 
one of the only languages where you can merge two nouns, which leads to things like zeitgeist. So we can be very precise, but we can also get lost when it's very vague. And this stuff is very vague. So we need some guidance. Thank you. I think the most important thing is that there has developed a system of loose norms based on restraint in cyberspace. That these things shouldn't be done for um, death or serious harm. They shouldn't attack strong critical infrastructure um, targets. Um, but they're very loose norms. And I think what's needed now is strong multilateral institutions to enfranchise these and s translate these into to legal enterprises. And I'm not so sure the United States or China or any of these major actors can really lead from this front because they're very vested in terms of how they want to use this tool in the future. So I think that's the most important thing. And I'm also very heartened by, say, the Brazilian perspective where they focus on the societal impact, to say the educational impact. I think that's more critical because I think too often we forget that in cyberspace, when you have a target, it's not limited to the, to the military ever. Not, no matter how much you want to make it precise and make it very much targeted on a certain target, it spreads through all society. And that's a repercussion we all have to deal with. And I think we need to be aware of that more and not so much put it in the domain of military, but think about how this affects education. Uh, now there's a lot of challenges to how educational institutions are interacting with people due to the, the new legal norms and restraints. And uh, we're not thinking about that because this is where the internet came from and this is how it should develop in the future. But we've thought to speak of it in a language of militarization. And I think that's wrong. So uh, what other domain do we engage in where we can quite literally change every aspect of the domain itself? Uh, so, um, you know, Imagine being able to go in and design perfection. What would it look like? Well, that's hard to say right now. It's hard, it's almost impossible to predict. So the question is, is how do you develop a doctrine? So the United States has been developing doctrine for a long time. We publish more doctrine than just about anybody else in the world. I mean, we publish doctrine documents on top of doctrine documents. Uh, but at the same time, it's very difficult for us to say, we're gonna solve this problem. So we'll write a document that says, you know, we have a strategy for this, but then will DHS and DOD fight over the same thing? And they both want jurisdiction over it, or FBI wants jurisdiction, and they all want this. So everybody has their vision of where they are the strong power. But in a middle tier state where you have less entrenched, managed bureaucracy of large, massive DOD, US DOD infrastructure, DHS infrastructure, 100,000, 200,000, 2 million personnel organizations, what would it look like to build doctrine for a nation that does cyber defense, offense, and everything where you could develop the innovation, the platforms that allow for takeoff, for, uh, for intellectual development, education, and all of those types of things? So not just focusing on, well, this is the U.S. model. They built Cyber Command. We should build Cyber Command. Because the U.S. model is, is mired in, in significant challenges of its own. The DOD consistently says, we should be able to defend U.S. power grids. We're the ones with all the trained personnel. We're, all, we're the ones, and, and everybody makes the joke about DHS. Well, they, they are not quite capable. And then FBI says, well, we should be the investigative power. But what if you didn't have those constraints? Then start with a blank slate. You know, so I, I'm not a huge fan of the GDPR because it breaks the fundamental architectural structures of efficiency of the internet. But what if you could redesign as a Europe the fundamental architectures of efficiency, of innovation, of structure, and develop educational platforms that enable that to take off where you could combine two nouns to make something better. And that's the doctrine that you should be focused on, not the doctrine that works for massive bureaucracies in the United States or China, where we manage uh, things in a, in a fundamentally different structural pattern. If I can just two-finger onto that. I want you to write that. <laughs> if I can just two-finger onto that, I was going to say exactly the same thing, well, not in quite the same way, but education. I mean, look, democracies, 
thrive on contestation. Democracy is essentially, when it functions correctly, um, an exercise in controlled failure, right? Again and again, failure in social conversation, fa failure in policy, in a controlled fashion such that we actually move towards, not necessarily truth or fact or anything along those lines, but prudence and progress. The problem that we face increasingly with cyber conflict, particularly as it's not just cyber conflict, right? Cyber enabled it. Information warfare, um, hybrid warfare, political warfare, etc. However you want to phrase it, um, the problem we have increasingly faced in the you know big episodes you can think of in the past few years is that we experienced um, essentially Byzantine failures. And anybody, most people in the room, I'm sure get the reference, but it's failures that we didn't realize were failures, or we, or at least we couldn't tell that a failure had actually occurred. We didn't actually realize that there was a particular fault that fell outside of the control systems of our democratic substrate, right? The political processes, the educational processes, and social processes that are the, the bedrock of democracy. And so the way to solve that, apart from better war gaming and futurist analysis, is, um, is, is education. It's, it's fueling um, education focused on this domain, um, but integrated across um, all different uh, uh, areas of, of traditional um, academic and professional learning. Nick, Tim, you mind if I just step in real quick? Yeah, go for it. So Joseph Schumpeter, creator of disruption. Okay, so the, the U.S. wants security, okay? I don't think that's a big surprise. The U.S. thrives on maintaining security, at least in the modern post 9-11 era. We build our entire infrastructure around maintaining societal security. We I mean, you see as a minor security incident in the United States causes polling numbers in the United States to go nuts, okay? China thrives on stability. They thrive on establishing social control platforms that maintains massive societal stability. They allow certain, if you read Gary King's article on, on social media and other types of things, they thrive on stability. What does Germany thrive on? What can a Germany, what can a Japan, what can a, a, a European context, what do the countries that, what do you want to thrive on? Where do you want to be? And that is what you develop. <coughs> because if we focus on now, so everybody says, you know, the, this is, the internet didn't consider security. Well, the RFC number like three, I think, or 30, within the first 30 RFCs on the internet was a security protocol. So security has been embedded, but that wasn't the question. Where do we want to be? How do we want to get there? Do we want innovation? Do we want societies that are both stable, expressive, free, that innovate, that solve medical problems, that solve the challenges that get us to the next level as a, as a, as a, as a, as a collective? Or do we privilege the here and now, the security, the the stability or, in, or, or we try to revise our society in a Russian context to some historical myth that never really existed in the first place. And so that's the question that you have to ask when you, if you have the opportunity to, to radically create doctrine, create the where we want to be, and then in, in tennis, you know, you move to the ball. So move to the ball, that, that's the way to move to the ball. Write the doctrine and move to the... Tim. Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, uh, I agree with that in principle. <clears throat> um, for small and middle powers, um, and I think Aaron brought this up, you know, emulation is not the way to go. Um, emulating the hegemon is, is an odd thing to do anyway, the best of times. Um, but uh, I, I totally agree with this idea of finding your own way. Now, Michael Schmidt, if I read your comments yesterday at MSC properly, you said that basically states should have sorted out this norms issue years ago because most of them are fairly common sense. I agree with that. Um, those, some of those norms are, are sort of being shaped and emerging as we go, but the basic principles of how states operate in cyberspace, barring one or two little sticking points, are pretty well established. So just sign up to that in, in what you do in practice. Okay? But there's plenty of, like doctrine, those norms and international law provide a playing field in which states can find their own ways, but respecting law and established norms and emerging norms, and actually Focus, and this is the main point, focus on exactly as Aaron just said, what is it that your country wants to do and what does it want to be? That's a grand strategic issue. We seem to get so wound up in what it is that the US is doing, what it is that China's doing, and, and, and this is why I like this book, you know, what it is, 
what is Russia doing that we forget that the other 190 odd countries in the world also have an equal voice in the international system about what they want and there's an awful lot of multilateral organizations and institutions out there that can help in that process. But I do think it's up to each country to set its strategic priorities and attempt to find ways and means to deliver on those ends uh, and attempting somehow to deliver its own future rather than being mortgaged um, to the interests of great powers. And I know that's a tall order in, in the way that um, international structure <laughs> operates and, and international organizations too. But I think you know, keeping your eyes on the prize and that applies to my own country, the UK, which is by no means a major power anymore. In fact, it's a declining power for all sorts of obvious reasons. But um, you know, it needs to find its own strategic path as well. And frankly, at the moment, it doesn't have one. So, Brandon, you, uh, I, there was a section in your book that was uh, quite strong and powerful. You say in the book that we need to move the discourse toward the reality of what cyber tools are good for, how they work, and how they achieve effects. We need to talk about coercion, not war. Policymakers would be wise to stop offering cyber bombs and start focusing on the more mundane task of building network defenses and resiliency. There are no rocks to throw, only information to steal and digital spies to catch. So be considering that we're hosted this week uh, here by the NATO CCD COE, and much of the conversation today has uh, focused on how NATO is operationalizing the cyber domain and how individual countries are setting up their cyber commands. Would you say NATO uh, has got its cyber strategy right? Is NATO on the right path? I'm not really sure any state or any organization is on the right path. I mean, clearly we had that challenge in America. We haven't developed a cyber strategy even though it's been demanded for almost two years now. Now, NATO's offered a few things about offensive capabilities, but of course, the most important thing for any offense is a good defense, and I think we've forgotten that lesson in cybersecurity because we view it as so new and unique and innovative, and I think that's a big challenge. And, um, you know, I love that there's deba debate in this field. Um, I've been coming to SciCon for a while now. Uh, I've loved, uh, you know, every panel, every workshop that CCDCOE has invited me to, and I love the health of the interaction we have here in trying to find a path. And we're all grasping for a path. And I really thank this panel too, because I believe these three uh, scholars are you know, the strongest emerging or emerged scholars we have in the field of cybersecurity. And I've always loved Liv's, Liz's comments at workshops and all the events we go to, even especially in America with so many loud and forceful Americans. You've always had very great insightful comments to add to the debate. And I think we need more of that. I think we have too many people selling old wine and new glasses and not thinking about really what this domain is good for. And before we can think about the offense, before we can think about destruction, we first need to think about survival. And that's the key lesson at Herman Kahn's on thermonuclear war. And if you want to talk about massive warfare or nuclear war, and you want to use that analogy, you need to think about the consequences. But we don't think about the consequences enough at this point. Oh, wonderful. So this book is full of good ideas. I recommend that uh, you buy it, you get it. Uh, you can't get it in Europe yet. The book is available in the United States and Amazon.com. It will be available in uh, Europe as of midsummer. So Brandon, thank you and thank you to your co-authors for writing this book and to our other panelists. Keep writing books and articles because this uh, very scholarly uh, and macro level view on this issue will certainly help ensure us that we have better strategies and better approaches by states as they engage in this domain. And with that, we have reached uh, the end of our allotted time. We've finished on time. Ho I hope you'll enjoy Tallinn today. It's still a warm, sunny evening, so have a wonderful time. P certainly go to the city tours if you haven't uh, been on them in the past years. They're wonderful. And uh, welcome back tomorrow.